Now can you hear me? Oh, good. You're awake. It's been a while since I've preached. So I <laughs> Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, God, we are so thank we are so thankful, Lord, to have your love and your forgiveness, your grace, your patience working with us. Father, uh, instruct us. We have lifted up our hearts and lifted up our prayers, lifted up our worship to you. And now, Lord, we want to continue in the spirit of openness and of dialogue. And we pray that your voice would be heard through the scriptures now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I am going to finish the series that I started all the way back in January, if you can believe that. And I, I'd mentioned back then that series are usually something that you don't want big gaps in, because if you're going to dovetail one thought next to another, you don't want to have those thoughts separated by multiple weeks. So I knew I was taking a gamble, and uh, but I've, I've, I've done my best to try to make this series of messages uh, applicable and and something that we can uh, journey together with and and learn from called it faith matters faith matters is kind of the the basis of the series and for the final message the topic we're going to be looking at is peace that's that's a good way to end the series isn't it peace uh, just the word itself kind of has an enriching characteristic to it doesn't it just saying the let's just say the word just say it peace I mean, just the word alone it evokes uh, a refreshment, doesn't it? And uh, maybe it's psychosomatic, I, I don't know, but uh, I think it's a worthy thing as we look at why uh, peace matters so much to us in our faith journey and what God wants us to consider when it comes to this attribute of our faith, peace, and what priority and emphasis the Lord places on it. Um. Like I said, I haven't preached in a while. I've got a lot built up. Can I share right here at the outset a little bit of a thought that does relate to peace? It does, I promise. Okay, Sarah. Um, but it is, it is somewhat of an, a, an anecdote, if I can put it that way. I, uh, I love uh, being a student of Scripture. I love... Uh, looking at how God is fulfilling His plan and promises through history and prophecy. Uh, but just recently, and this may not be new to some of you uh, as Bible students, um, when you think about it in the context, you know, the Lord says in the last days, watch out for wars, doesn't He? And to be attentive to the fact that nations are going to be at war with one another and there's going to be these convulsions of, of, of the earth. And, and, and so, uh, as, as a, uh, as the Advent people and as people of prophecy, we have been from our very beginning, uh, ones who look at world events and trying to see how they align with what God has shown us through the prophecies in the scriptures. But I have a thought for you in the context of peace. And in the context of what the Lord may include in looking for in last day events. Um, I, I know that we have a, a war going on right now in Eastern Europe, right? Uh, and we've talked about that. We've prayed for the people of Ukraine. And we have had um, a presentation of missions and ministry going to the needs of Ukraine. And we, our, our minds and our, our attentions perk up when we see these things happening in, in flesh and blood and when war comes. However, I want to just share with you, while I don't dispute the idea that physical violent wars are a part of the fulfillment of the Lord's warnings of the last days to, work, to look out for wars, I am becoming more of a, an advocate of the idea that the greater war that we are to look for between nations and between people is the battlefield of the mind. Okay? Where are wars really won and lost? When a nation loses a war, does that mean that they have given up the argument and they now no longer harbor evil feelings? Where are battlefields really waged? Where did the war in heaven begin? 
Didn't it begin in the mind of Satan and in the argument of the enemy? Isn't the battlefield of the mind maybe not even of equal but of greater significance? When you think of the battle of Armageddon in the last days, most of the Protestant Christian world is looking for a physical conf- uh, confrontation in Israel and in that context. Is it possible that that's not the most direct fulfillment of Jesus words. I, I, would have, I would be very interested to know what it would be like to be in the minds of Seventh-day Adventists in 1914. When a warrior nation led by a man who calls himself Caesar, right? That's what Kaiser means in German, okay? Uh, Wilhelm called himself Caesar, and he wanted to rule, although throughout World War I, he called it a defensive war. Did you know that? For the entirety of, of World War I, Germany says, we're fighting a defensive war, which is interesting. But he called himself Caesar, and he allied himself with the Ottoman Turks in Turkey. Can you imagine being a Seventh-day Adventist in 1914 going, oh my goodness, this is the war. Someone called Caesar, partnering with the Muslim Turks. I mean, come on, think about it. Don't you think Seventh-day Adventists in 1914 thought this is it? This is the end. Caesar's back on the rise. But the Lord didn't come, did he? Then in 1939, again, that war, even though there was a treaty, did the war end? No. In 1939, a new uh, leader comes along, and he specifically targets the Jews. And I wonder what it would be like to be a Seventh-day Adventist in 1939 or or 1940 looking at the rise of another European power, specifically targeting the descendants of of the Jews and, and that nation, and be thinking, this is the war, the Lord is coming. But He didn't come. If the Lord didn't come during those wars, is it possible that God wants us to look at war in a different way? There will be physical, again, I don't debate that there's not going to be armies on the move and there's going to be physical wars, but I think the battlefield of the mind is the greater war that we are facing in the last days. Think about it let me know, and then I'll tell you how wrong you are. No, that's it. Peace. Let's talk about peace. Question number one, Toby's going to have a mic here, and so for any of you young people that want to raise your hands, we'd love to get you uh, to be able to be heard by everyone here. How does Paul begin all of his letters? Does he say grace to you and peace from God? Does he say be of good cheer? Does he say the Lord bless you and keep you? Or does he say, brethren, lend me your ears? Ketsia? Ketsia is going to give it a... How does every single one from Romans and... Ephesians, every single one of his letters, he begins with this. Go ahead. See? See, the Lord bless you and keep you. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But that's not right. All right, uh, see some hands in the sound booth. Sebastian? Grace to you and peace from God. You are right, Sebastian. That's how Paul begins every single one of his epistles. In the New Testament, from Romans to Philemon. Now, sometimes he will say other things like Paul, an apostle, with Timothy, etc., etc. But within that first salutation, in every single one of his letters, he begins this way. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes he adds the word mercy. Okay? And again, we skip over these sometimes when we're reading the Bible that it's just a quick salutation like when you see someone on the street. Hey, how you doing? You know, how's it going? And we just kind of see it as just a, 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 a congenial phrase. But I find it interesting that when Paul is going to address the New Testament church, he wants to make sure that he begins with grace and peace. Anything you hear from now on, know that it is saturated in grace and peace. And he ends all of his letters with grace as well. So that's significant. Paul is a person that uh, before his conversion was not a big fan of grace or peace, was he? But when he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and when God got a hold of his heart, grace and peace 
completely changed his life. And he wants to know, he wants the New Testament church to benefit from that as well. And that's a good message to us today as well. Whenever we're entering into conversation, wouldn't it be great if we always uh, uh, seasoned our conversation to begin with, with grace and peace? Wouldn't that change a lot of the, the controversies and conversations in our life if we always remember to begin with grace and peace? Who is called the Prince of Peace? Number two, who is called the Prince of of peace, Solomon, Hezekiah, Jesus, or Melky Zadik. Okay, look around. I see Dylan over here. Or, yeah, there's Dylan over here. Jesus. Okay, Jesus. And uh, let's get Eric and then Gio. Solomon. Wow, Solomon. Uh, Dylan, we got some competition here. Gio's got the last one here for us. He's going to... He's going to sort this out. D. D. D? Melchizedek? How many of you know? Raise your hand if you know. <laughs> Actually, the first three are all princes of peace. Solomon is called the son of peace, the son of David. His name, Solomon, Shalom. You know, his name means peace. And being the son of David, he was to, as David was the warrior king, so then Solomon was to be the prince of peace. Hezekiah is the son of Ahaz, and he was the initial fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that unto you a son shall be given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. That was, that was Hezekiah. The initial fulfillment of that, fulfilled in the days of Isaiah, was Hezekiah, and he is called the son of peace in Isaiah 39. But of course, all of these were uh, uh, symbols of Christ. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the prince of peace. Very interesting. He carries a lot of titles, the Lord does. He's, you know, he's the Lord of, uh, of hosts, and he's a uh, uh, the king of righteousness and all these things. Melchizedek is similar. His name means king of peace, so I put him up there. Kind of a, a similar thing, but these are the three that you could specifically say were called prince of peace. What animal symbolizes peace? A lamb, an eagle, a fish, a dove, or a unicorn? Any young people here? You're kind of spread out. You're going to have to... Go ahead. Anyone you see? Eric? A dove. <clears throat> a dove. I can, you're all choked up about it. I can tell. I'm, it's very sensitive to me as well. I appreciate that spirit. All right, Eric. Actually, he got it, guys. I know that you guys probably realize that too. But the dove is the symbol of peace in the Bible. The two prominent stories, of course, of course are when Noah releases the dove after the judgment, symbolizing the judgment had ended and peace had reigned. And then when the Holy Spirit, in the, in the shape of a dove, alighted on Jesus, the Prince of Peace, indicating the presence of the Holy Spirit. Last question. What do we call this list? There's a list in the Bible. It's, it has love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What do we call this list? Ketsia? Or, oh, I'm sorry, let, let Anna. I, I told you to do it, Toby. Now here I'm telling you what to do. What? Be. Be the fruit of the Spirit. Anyone else want to guess? That doesn't mean she's wrong. I just want to give others a chance. Dylan's behind you. I appreciate you helping, Toby. Oh, that's Isaiah, but... Beef. B. B? Everyone in agreement? All right. Thank you very much. You are correct. That's all of them, Toby. Thank you for your help. Thank you, pe young people, for helping out. Just a little way of getting into the, the topic of peace. So here you have the list, love, joy, and you see that within this list is peace. Now, the thing that I just want to mention real quickly about the fruit of the Spirit, sometimes we understand these things as attributes that we should have. We should feel love. We should feel joy. And that, that way we know that the Holy Spirit is in us because we have peace. We have kindness. But really, they are called the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Meaning we should produce these things. Do you understand the difference? It's great if you have peace. That's wonderful. But you are called to be someone who produces peace. Do you understand the difference? 
You are to be agents of these things in the world. Okay, if you just harbor these things, well, I'm filled with joy. I don't, you know, your world may be falling apart, but I'm happy. Ah, great, the Holy Spirit's with me, and I've got kindness and gentleness. Yeah, you can be all wicked out there, but I'm good. That's not what the fruit of the Spirit is at all. We know that the Holy Spirit is operating in our lives when we affect the world around us and we produce these things in others. You with me? Are you with me? So let me ask you, do you have the Holy Spirit today? Are you producing love in your world? Are you producing joy? Are you a blessing to others? Are you actively working to produce peace? Because I tell you what, that's what the Lord wants to do through you and in your life. All right, let's talk about peace for a moment. Remember, this is on the context of faith matters. Why does faith matter? And again, we could talk, uh, we've talked about some different subjects. We can't do them all. Paul says this in Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. Amen? We know that we have reached a place in our walk with Christ where faith matters when we, in our inmost soul, have peace. Does that make sense? This isn't meant to be complicated. We know that God is doing things in our life and that we have attached ourselves to faith in Jesus Christ when within our inmost soul, within our being, we have a tranquility of heart, we have a serenity of mind, and we are at peace. Amen? That's not, uh, again, that's not, uh, you know, uh, high uh, scholarship to understand that relationship. And yet the devil does everything possible to steal and rob and destroy the peace of God's people. Have God's people always been known as people of peace? No, we still fall victim and prey to the same things that the rest of the world comes to. But we know, here, here's the thing. If you want to know that faith is living and growing and developing in your life, is at the same time you have a greater confidence in God's oversight and plan and will in your life. How do you think the church has survived the generations of persecution and division and diaspora and everything else unless God's people have had peace in their hearts? Or else uh, the religion of Jesus Christ would have faded away years and years ago because the devil would have done that. This is the, the series that we've been in, and I went ahead and threw up the topics. I wish I could do a summary again and a reminder of everything that we went through uh, beginning uh, with this series. And I just want to remind you, all the way back to January, what spurred this series on in my mind goes to Romans chapter 10 and verse 2, when Paul, talking about the Jewish nation, says, they have a zeal for God, right? The Jews have a zeal for God, but they lack knowledge, they lack knowledge. And Dr. John McKay, who, who said the quote, to have commitment without reflection is fanaticism. Okay? You remember that? To be committed to something without thinking it through is fanatical. Now, let me ask you a question. Is fanaticism on the increase or decrease in our society? That wasn't meant to be a trick question. Is fanaticism, fanaticism for different politics, fanaticism for different products? Are people more or less fanatically following <clears throat> their sport team these days? I, I hope I'm not having to twist your arm on this. I would, I would argue that we are becoming a more of a fanatical people than we've ever become uh, here in America. And a large part of that is we don't think things through. We commit ourselves to something, but we don't think them through. Now, I, I try to avoid super hot potatoes uh, when I'm up here on stage, and I want to be respectful, but I can't help but at least as an analogy just identify that right now, and friends, we may be needing to be praying through and, and figuring out if this summer the Supreme Court does say Roe v. Wade is a thing of the past and we're going to look at it from a different way, we're going to see things in our society that are going to be quite, quite complex. Okay. Now, whatever side you happen to be on on this debate, 
I have yet to really have a quality conversation with someone on the topic of abortion where I could tell they've really thought it through. On either side. On either side. People tend on these hot-button topics to commit to an idea, maybe looking at it from one perspective, but rarely on both sides have they really thought it through. And that leads to fanaticism on both sides, fanaticism. Now, I don't mean to say I don't have an opinion on this, but with the sensitivity, and that's just not the topic I'm addressing today, but if we would simply think things through, we would avoid many of the pitfalls and the hysteria that we sometimes get into. Commitment without reflection is fanaticism, and reflection without commitment is is paralysis. Then we talk about creation, the foundation of our faith, and the cross, and all these things we've weaved and ebbed. Um, and I know uh, we could. Uh, there's a hundred other topics I could have included in this series, but I had to. Uh, I had to limit it. And so we come now to the topic of peace. And I'm very much convinced that this is a good way to end the past the uh, this series. If you have your Bibles, turn to John 14. I have a a passage on the screen, but I'm going to be in the chapter a few other places, and it may be of benefit to you to be able to see it uh, for yourself. John chapter 14, very powerful passage of Scripture. This is these uh, three chapters, uh, four chapters, 14, 15, 16, and 17, are are an intimate conversation that Jesus has with His disciples right before His his passion right before Gethsemane and the arrest and, and all the rest that happens after that. So a very important passage, as, as all Scripture is, to be sure. But I, wanna, I want you to notice this part about peace. You remember that it begins with Jesus encouraging His followers, don't let your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. You remember that, right? Jesus is saying, I'm not going to be with you forever. There's a different mission that God has for me. It's part of His plan. I'm leaving. I am leaving. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself, that where I am, you may be also. So we remember that. Come then down to verse 27, and we're going to pick up the statement of Jesus here. Notice what He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. He almost repeats word for word the beginning of verse 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. You heard that I have said to you, I go away. This is kind of like the bookends of this pericope of statement that Jesus is giving us here. He begins with, I'm going away, don't let your heart be troubled. And now here at the end, he says, "Um, I'm also going away, don't let your heart be troubled. And here at the end, he gives this Uh, uh, counsel to his disciples. He says, peace I leave with you. I'm going, but I'm leaving you with something. And isn't it interesting that Jesus chose the attribute peace? Think about what he could have chosen. He could have said love. I'm going to leave you with love or hope, confidence, righteousness, faith. I mean, all these wonderful things. Jesus says, what I'm going to leave you is peace. Matthew Henry says that when Jesus was leaving the earth, he made sure that his affairs were in order. He gave his spirit to the Father. You know, on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. All right. He gives his body to uh, Joseph of Arimathea. His clothes become the property of the Roman soldiers who gambled over him. He even made sure his mother was cared for. And then, and then he asked John to be, uh, to be in charge and to take care of the, uh, of the things for his mother. But what could Jesus leave? What could he bequeath his disciples? What did he have to give them? He didn't have silver or money. He didn't have gold. He gave them the most precious commodity he could. Peace I leave with you. That's what he wished for his disciples. Peace. Now, I want you to notice something else. He says, my 
peace. Sometimes, again, when we hear these phrases, we kind of just see them as, as friendly colloquial statements, you know, like, oh, peace be with you and, and things like that. But in this way, Jesus makes it very personal. He doesn't want us to just understand this as a, as a quick rhetoric or statement. He makes it personal. He says, what I have, I'm going to give to you, and what I have is peace. My peace I give to you. Not generic peace, not some general uh, uh, sentiment of peace, but my peace, that which I have to give to you is my peace, and I'm going to give that to you. And then he makes it clear. Not as the world gives it, do I? Everybody, you know, a lot of people think that they have peace. People that do extremely radical things. Very few fanatics think they're the ones that are fanatical. They say the other ones are fanatics. I'm, I'm very reasonable and, and, and level-headed. I have nothing but peace in my heart as I do these terrible things. I mean, people, you can twist things in your mind to say, oh, yeah, I, I have peace in my heart. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this decision that's very destructive and it's going to be terrible, but, but I have peace in my heart about it. Uh, the, the human mind has the capacity to, to do this to us. Jesus makes it clear, the peace that I'm offering you is not the peace of the world. It's my peace. You don't get to define it. I'm going to define it for you. And we could kind of think of peace as the culmination of faith, hope, and love, all working together to uh, create peace. Do we need more peace in our world right now? And why I began with that idea of a peace of the mind. We can solve the militant battles of the world, and they might, you know, go away or they might uh, uh, quiet themselves for a while. But the greater peace that God wants us to have and produce in the world and have in our own heart and bring to others is the peace of heart and mind and soul. And if we are not experiencing that, and if we're not producing that in others. We're missing out on the gift that Jesus has given to us. So what is Jesus's peace? When he says, my peace, where did Jesus find peace? Now, this is not going to be uh, super profound. This is going to be extremely simple as, as much of what the scriptures are. We, we don't really have to delve deep. Where did Jesus find peace in his trials in his life? Well, first we know he found it in scripture. When he was tempted by the devil, alone, fasting in the wilderness, where did he find peace? Where did he find the ability to overcome the assaults and deceptions of the devil? He found it in Scripture. He found it in Old Testament Scripture, Greta. That old crusty kind of stories about those weird people and all those rituals. That's where Jesus found peace in knowing the truth and life and power of the Scriptures so that he could overcome the deceptions and the tricks and the counterfeits of the devil. So, how are you in your daily diet of Scripture? Have you made Scripture the foundation of your Christian walk? We used to be known as the people of the book. At Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, that used to be a term used for the Seventh-day Adventist church. We are the people of the book. Going all the way back to the 1870s and the 1880s when we were doing evangelistic series, and there would be all kinds of emphasis in the community, and the Seventh-day Adventist community would rise up. They would be known as the people of the book because of our ability to know and memorize and dissect and digest biblical Scripture. I think we need to be that people today as much, if not more, uh, than we were back then. We need to be a people of the book. Are you studying your lessons? I know I could do better. Jesus found peace in Scripture. And then, again, not profound. Where did Jesus find his strength? Where did he go to get refilled and refueled when he dealt with all the stresses of life? He was constantly in prayer. Constantly in prayer. And through that prayer, he found peace and confidence. And in Gethsemane, he's able to say, not my will, but your will be done, even as he's sweating great drops of blood. Again, I just remind you that this is the peace. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. And this is where I got it. I got it from Scripture. I got it from my relationship with the Father. And then I would argue as just as important, Jesus found peace in serving others. 
and making others the priority in his life and not himself. That was his entire life, was serving others. People would come to him and say, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me whole. And what was Jesus' reply? That's what I'm here for. I am willing. I'm, I've come to serve. I've come to be a blessing. I've come to raise up those who are discouraged. I've come to heal. I've come to set free. And in putting others before himself, he was able to find peace. And peace ultimately is found in trust in God. These things are the things that build our trust in God by being devoted to Scripture, by being devoted to prayer, by being devoted to serving one another and not making ourselves a priority in our life. We'll find peace. It's easy to get discouraged today. It's easy to be depressed. Any of you that are needing baby formula? I don't know what is going on in the state of Arizona. I've heard it's a problem. Inflation. Anger. Crime. War. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to be depressed. God does not want His people to be lost in discouragement and despair. He's given us a resource. He's given us, he says, I am leaving, but what I am leaving, what I'm giving to you when I leave is peace. And you will know that faith matters when you can stand before God in your prayer closet or in your devotions, and you can, look, you can raise your head to the heavens and know that God is still your Savior, and He is on your side and He will never abandon you. I liked this passage and how I want to end. The work of righteousness will be peace. And the service of righteousness, quietness and confidence forever. My prayer for you today, for all of us, our church, for our people, is that we would learn to find the peace that Jesus promised us when he left this earth. And it's not a secret. It's not a complicated formula. It is there right before us for us to grasp and appreciate. It's what he gave us, his peace. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Thank you, Lord, that we can just spend a few moments reflecting on this very basic idea. And it seems so easy to just think it and say it. It's so much different to try to live it. And the devil does such a good job to point out all the problems and to point out all of the sadness and all the confusion and make us say, where is God anyways? But Lord, we know that you went through discouragement yourself. We know that you were under tremendous pressure. But by showing us your example of being a student of Scripture and devoted to prayer and willing to put others first, you could endure anything. And you want us to have that same victory. So Father, as we go about our plans this summer, as we go about our lives and as we face the temptations in the wilderness, as we face the challenges that you did like in the Garden of Gethsemane, the trials and the persecution, or maybe it's just the normal challenges of life, Father, I pray that we would cling to the peace that you promised us and that we would be a people of peace. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Cut me off th th three seconds too early. As, as Paul began his letters, grace and peace be with you in God the Father and in Jesus Christ our Lord. God bless.